Welcome to the Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and once again, I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin Graham. Welcome back to the Celtic State of Mind, Kevin. How are you doing? Hi there, Paul. How are you? I'm good. We're here this evening to talk about our new weekly feature, which is a Celtic State of Minds video club. Kevin, talk to us about the inspiration behind Axom's video club. I remember when you sent me the text about you had this idea of, yeah, and you got the idea from the Tim Burgess listening parties, where if you don't know what Tim Burgess does, is he picks an album and it starts at a certain time and everybody plays that album and they comment on it. And Tim Burgess has been really, really good that he's got members of the bands involved. Um, what A couple of the big ones, he's done one with the Twilight Sad, but he's also also got a, he also had a, he's done the free oasis albums when i say the free oasis albums the free main oasis albums and he got bonehead involved so it's, it's just to give uh, we took our inspiration for that because it brings people together on social media especially during these strange surreal times that, that we're in mm-hmm. it's also a bit of looking back it's also a bit of community spirit it's also yeah. a bit of a lot of these videos, like like mine's, will be up in a loft somewhere, and we no longer have a video player to actually watch them. So some of them are a, a wee trip back to childhood, and it's just really, really interesting to see the production of club media. 20 or 25 years ago and even longer actually sometimes 30 years ago yeah. and it's, it's really really interesting to see what they used to punt out as <laughs> content <laughs> which is but, but this is it this is it it is, it is the old version of content creation Kevin I mean we are here talking podcasts we've gone through the era of you know fanzines of we're now into alternative fan media, which podcast is uh, an aspect of that, a thread of that, blogging, vlogging, you know, all this kind of thing. And it's great to embrace it. And Celtic, I think Celtic fans are well served by that. But you're absolutely right. Tim Burgess, lead singer of the Charlatans, I'm sure everybody's listening will know that. As a band, the Charlatans, for me, for a number of years, Kevin, I was a big Charlatans fan, always bought their albums or singles, went to see them live. There was probably a period in maybe three or four albums where my interest completely waned in the Charlatans. I thought their output fell off the edge of a cliff. When I read Tim Burgess's first book, and it was called Telling Stories, I think, his it first was. book, and uh-huh. then his second one was uh, Tim Book 2, I think it was mm-hmm. called. And his and first one was talking about drug drug abuse around about the time of the three albums I'm talking about, and it does not surprise me because I just thought... You know, the, the quality just wasn't there for me. And I, I was a big Charlatans fan. And I kind of lost a bit of interest uh, during that time. But I have been following his uh, Twitter listening parties online. And I thought at the time, I thought, what a really simple but creative idea. And like you say, everybody in the Twitter sphere presses play all at the same time on a specific album. So 8 o'clock at night, everybody presses play on What's the Story of Morning Glory, for example. And because Tim Burgess is who he is and he's got a, a huge big contact list and all the rest of it, he normally gets one or two members of the band in. And he done it with Doves as well, didn't he? He done it with Lost Souls with Jimmy Goodwin. He done it with Glass, Glass Vegas as well. Glass Vegas, another bunch of friends of the show. But uh, <laughs> and, and the way that it works is, you know, everybody's listening to the same song at the same time. So you're getting the reaction and everybody uses the, the hashtag Tim's Twitter listening party. And uh, obviously they engage with... For example, Bonehead at Oasis, or James Allen at Las Vegas, Jimmy Goodman at Doves, and it works really well. So we decided, like most reasonable ideas, we'll kind of rip that off. And it just so happens that uh, I had been collecting for maybe the last year, Kevin, the Dead Collection, which is the VHS video. I mean, if you, any stage of your life, collected programmes, for example, you're embarking on a collection which never ends. You know, you're not only you're trying to get things retrospectively, but the, the collection continues and continues with every game. So it's very unusual to have a, like a dead collection where you, you can actually complete the game, if you like. But VHS videos are that simply because of the, the technological advances. And it's exactly what you said there. You know, we were winning nothing in the 90s, but by God, did we produce videos. We were punting a lot of videos out and it was all, a lot of it was looking back to the glory days. Um, So what I tried to do, because there was actually a lack of a comprehensive list online, even the one on the Celtic Wiki was not accurate. So the first thing I tried to do was to create a list. And as far as I am aware, and I'm 
open to being corrected here. The first one that was ever released was the Celtic story, the famous Celtic story, the one that was filmed around the Lisbon and all that brilliant footage of Jock Steen around the pool with the players and all that, Kevin. It was a famous, famous film made in the 60s, but it was released by Celtic in 1982. And then it was later released in 1997 uh, by Cameron Williams, who released most of these videos. But 1982 is the first video, 1982. And uh, we moved kind of slowly through the 80s. There were a few. One of the pivotal ones was the official history of Celtic Football Club, which I'm looking forward to covering eventually. But once we got into the 90s, I mean, we were releasing sometimes three videos a year. And that is quite incredible when we were winning nothing. I mean, look at 1992. Let's have a look at 92. Eight Celtic videos were released in 1992 alone. So I had been gathering these up so that we could use them for something. Not illegally. We weren't going to broadcast them or any of that kind of stuff. But the Twitter listening parties gave us the idea we, as a fan base, could watch a video on a Sunday night and we could get the dialogue going on Twitter. So, so far, we have done Return to Paradise. And during the the Tommy Burns story, we had members of Tommy's family chipping in during the, the watching of that film, which was excellent. We then looked at the Celtic Collection Volume 4. That was a video magazine, the brainchild of Terry Cassidy. And during the watching of that video, we had Andy Payton, former Celtic striker, who was answering questions. And then the third part of the club has been the Celtic Diary, which was a very similar idea to the Celtic collection, but it was launched in Tommy's final season. So we're going to talk about the first three videos, Kevin, and then we will let our listeners know what the fourth video is going to be tomorrow night. So video number one, Return to Paradise, the Tommy Burns Celtic story. This was released in 1994 by Caledonian Television Limited. The back of the box synopsis reads, For a man who won six League Championship medals and five Scottish Cup winners medals, playing for Celtic, it was a dream come true. Tommy Burns was back at his beloved Parkhead, and this time as manager. Exclamation mark. There's a lot of exclamation marks on these boxes. As a player, in 14 years with Celtic, he made nearly 500 first-team appearances, he actually made more than 500, I'd like to correct Caledonian Television. The researchers obviously dropped a bollock with that. And won every domestic honour, international honours, included a precious cap against England at Wembley, one of the last players to appear in that famous fixture. Burns biographer, journalist Hugh Keevans explained, For Tommy Burns, Celtic isn't just a football team. It's a cause and a way of life. As a small boy attending St Mary's, where the Celtic story started, He dreamed of pulling on the green and white hoops. He's the supporter whose place in the history of Celtic is assured. This is a dramatic inside story of a man and his club, from Celtic Boys Club to Celtic Manager in the space of two memorable decades. So there you have it, Return to Paradise. We've got inaccuracies with his appearances, we've got quotes from Hugh Keevans, but let's talk about the film, Kevin. Take us back to 1994 when Return to Paradise came out and uh, what was it like watching this again? What's your critique my critique, obviously, it's a feel-good story of we're at, we're at Hamden that season, Tommy's returned, so the club have decided to try and tug on our sentimental heartstrings by pro- producing a video which right away shows you that season, we won 2 nothing at Ibrox early on that season, eh? So the first thing that yeah. you actually see in this video is John Collins scoring that great free kick. So that sets the tone of the video up right away then they start firing through what Tommy won as a player so you've got great cup finals great league ones and that eh? so it's just like a massive feel good factor of this is Celtic we're coming back Fergus is now in charge Tommy's here it's it's just to like see nowadays it would be something that the in-house club would produce on a pre-season tour like when the, the, yeah. the, the interviews with Tommy and that, I mean, it must have been very easy to interview Tommy because he's very passionate, he's very articulate, he's got a great eye for a story, a great eye for a narrative and it must have been really, really easy for the production team to use Tommy. Funnily enough, one of the one thing that jumped out right away about the video was it was narrated by Jock Brown, which mm-hmm. was a bit surprising. But the, the old footage is great, and this video especially got me thinking about Davy Proven because Proven was involved in an awful lot of Tommy's successes as well, and obviously mm-hmm. Proven we, we just know him basically now as the the Sky commentator, the co commentator, the sometimes boot boy of Scottish football. But yeah. when you actually see him like playing what a fantastic player 
And it's good to be reminded about that. And it's the same way, again, this video is dealing with 1994, so there's a lot of appearances by Paul McStay and Charlie Nicholas, which obviously the two senior players in the dressing room at that time. And it's funny just seeing Charlie Nicholas walking about Celtic Park being welcome at Celtic Park Yes, as well. As I says, it's a feel-good feel video. And it's got an interview with Brian Scott when he's talking about sports science. There's an absolutely set-up scene when all the players are sitting in the boardroom eating pasta and Jaffa cakes and soup. <laughs> there's a scene with Charlie Nicholas just standing there in his pants. And there's a scene with Pat Bonner just getting undressed. It's stuff like that which at the time would have been absolutely groundbreaking for us. To, it's like seeing an inner sanctum of of the club, of behind the doors that you don't actually see. If, again, with hindsight, looking back on it, it is there as a promotional tool. And it's these promotional tools you see every single day on social media now. And it's just, yep. you just think about it, you go, that would have cost the club quite a bit of money to get that done. Whereas nowadays it can be done filmed and uploaded within half an hour. It's just, it's just how times have changed. But obviously, we've got to comment on the music. Obviously, music rights were still expensive in the early 90s as well. So you've got ice cream van versions of songs that you vaguely recognise on all three, all, all three of the videos, which is quite hilarious, actually. It is. The big thing for me going through these videos is, or, or with any real content creation, Kevin, is the need, the absolute necessity to have original bespoke content. And I think that really is the mantra of a Celtic state of mind. When you're telling a story, there's always got to be an onus on showing archive footage. Because if you're talking about a specific individual, you've got to show the viewer what it is you're talking about. This guy's a great player, Tommy Burns, the cultured left foot. I mean, some of the goals in this video, when they're talking about his playing career, are, you know, phenomenal. Unbelievable. But Unbelievable. The material you're talking about, the behind-the-scenes stuff, that's the stuff that's memorable because we've seen all the goals. I mean, there's very, very few Celtic goals out there. The, the only Celtic goals I'm aware of that we've not seen are the ones that were captured by the Celtic Cine Club. You know, the, the 50s and 60s cine club, the Celtic cine club, and their videos largely are unseen. Other than that, everything more or less has been on Celtic videos in the past. It all comes down to the research, though, because when I was working on Andy Lynch's book, we contacted STV and BBC, and we got loads of games that hadn't largely been seen. I mean, obviously, they were shown at the time, Kevin, as part of the highlights package. But there was, like, games against Stenhouse Muir, for example, and it shows Andy Lynch going on a mazy run and setting up a goal and scoring a goal and all this stuff. And it was footage that was great simply because I hadn't seen it. But when you watch a Tommy Burns video, you've got to see these high points of his career and we've all seen them before and that's fine. But that almost just allows the story to kind of roll on. Important part is this new era. And quite early on in the video, we get an interview from Fergus McCann who, you know, Fergus is always just Fergus. He never ever changes when he's speaking the same tone, the same kind of language, the, the same kind of lack of emotion a lot of the time. So it was very much like ushering in a new era at Celtic. Hence the name Return to Paradise as well, I guess, because we knew that you know it wasn't going to be long before we did Return to Paradise after the season at Hamden. But what I did love was the bespoke footage, you know, filming Tommy leaving his house in the morning to go to his work, jumping in his green Phoenix Honda, which was a sponsored car, and then on his way to the, the park, nipping into St Mary's to, to do what Tommy did, you know. And that kind of thing makes it a memorable video, I think. Because obviously, you know, I'm not taking for granted all the goals, the Scottish Cup finals, the League Cup finals, the, even just the scissor kick goal that he scored against Partick this on the centenary season. But the most important thing for any of these videos, and we'll criticise some of them for not having it in the future, is all this kind of behind-the-scenes stuff, you know, under-the-floorboard stuff. And the Tommy Burns interviews are absolutely epic, aren't they? And we did actually get some comments from some of Tommy's children saying that it was just great to hear him again. Because we're all the same. Nobody keeps a video set up in the living room that, oh, no, let's just no. watch the Tommy Burns video. So these things, for me, it would be great if there was a place where they could all sit and Celtic fans could enjoy them. But because they're released by various different companies and then you've got the rights that are held by the league for the footage and all that kind of stuff, it's just not possible. You know, you're breaking all the kind of copyright laws. So the way we're doing it, Kevin, is anybody who's involved and it's growing, everybody's watching it at home and at the same time and we're all laughing at the same bits like, 
you know, Charlie Nicholas's his bloody smugglers and all that kind of stuff. But that drive, that drive for Tommy into Celtic Park, and you're just watching him, you're thinking, this guy has got his dream job. And it's even interesting watching that drive to Celtic Park because even that's changed, you know, driving up what is now the Celtic Way. And it is capturing, it's a document which captures that moment in time. And then he's walking into reception and it's all set up. So you see the receptionist on a phone pretending to be speaking to somebody and all that. It's great. I love it. It's absolutely brilliant. As, as you mentioned, that drive when he turns up past the primary school, and that does seem like an absolute lifetime ago, even though it's only it's within the last 10 years that's changed, but it seems like an absolute lifetime ago that that was there. You were talking about the archive footage. One of the things that's missing from this video is his speech after the 1988 Scottish Cup final. If you're making a video of Tommy Burns, you've got to get that they're there and always there in a video. And whoever made this video, I don't know whether STV wouldn't give them that footage or they never asked STV for that footage, but that's a major, major miss in the Tommy Burns story. I've got a theory on this one, Kevin, right? I totally agree with you 100%. I mean, that should have been the final words of this video, right? And that would have been the end of it. I think we were all greeting anyway when we watched it, but that would have just shoved us right over the edge. You know what I think it is? I just think that at the time when this was made... Now, I remember that speech. I remember it because I wasn't at the game. I think you were at the game, weren't you? I was at the game, I. I remember watching that live, that speech, and it struck a chord with me then. However, I think that speech has become iconic since this video was made. I think because of the advent of social media and sharing footage like that, and then obviously because of Tommy's passing as well, and people look at some of the quotes that that he's made, you know, I think it's become a powerful statement. Whereas back then, even though it was completely powerful when you watch it, I just don't think that they had kind of picked up on that. So they were just doing the usual. There's McAvaney scoring the winning goal. There's Tommy picking up the trophy. And they didn't actually dig in. And by the way, it was a huge blunder because it would have been the epic finale of the Tommy Burns. Great video though, I've got to say. Going back to two points you made. Brian Scott. It was good to hear from Brian Scott. I think I'm always quite sad, you know, thinking back to the lengthy time he was there. The players that he had a relationship with, the work he did with Henrik Larson, for example, to get Henrik fit again. And he's just almost been kind of airbrushed out the history books. You know, you never hear about Brian Scott now, do you? No, I'm actually struggling to remember when he would have left, truthfully. But I, I, he didn't leave on good terms if my memory's no playing tricks on me there. Yeah, it was a, there was a fallout with Martin O'Neill and um, eventually it went to, it did eventually go to court. There's actually something preventing Brian Scott from speaking about his time at Celtic, unfortunately, because again, because you look at the period of time that he was there, he'd be an interesting interview. Uh, but I just love, you know, Tommy getting ready with Tommy, Tom McAdam, Billy Stark, they're all getting ready together to go out to the training. I just love all that because, I mean, at that time there was a real feeling, Kevin, that this was a turning point in, in Celtic's history. Fergus coming in, Tommy coming back, plans for the stadium. You also mentioned Jock Brown. And I think it's of its time because your opinion of Brown has changed since this video was made. You know, so when we're watching it in 1994, there's a familiar voice narrating the, the, the Tommy Burns video. That's all it would be, a familiar voice in Scottish football media, if you like. But now you think Jock Brown and you think something slightly different because of the, the time that he spent at Celtic. I, I, I know, I, I, it's again, it's looking at these videos through modern eyes. As you say, at that time, Jock Brown narrating that video, would have, he would have expected it to tell you the truth. So, as you say, also in the video it shows you the 89 Cup final and I commented when I was watching it that Ian St John was a co-commentator and I went, wow, that's a a famous name at that point co-commentating on the Scottish Cup final and you just wouldn't get that today. Again, looking back, that's surprising as well. Uh, But as you say, at the time, when it happened, you wouldn't have batted an eyelid at Jock Brown or Ian St John being involved in any part of Scottish football. So, strange. I know. The times have certainly changed. But yeah, let's finish off the Tommy Burns section by trying to give this a rating. Let's talk about marks out of 10 for the Tommy Burns story. Watching it back a few weeks ago, probably watching it again just to get a feel for it for this podcast. Let, let's rate it. Give it a Kevin Graham rating out of 10. Oh, I would give it a 7. A 7, right. I'm going to gauge this on something like the official Celtic history being a 10, right? Because when we watch that and when we when we discuss it, I'm pretty sure most people will agree that that is the finest VHS tape that was made, right? So we're, we're looking at that maybe, let's say that's the top end of the scale. I'm going to go for the Tommy Burns story, an 8. 
I'm giving it an 8, you're giving it a 7. But basically, it's highly recommended, right? Now, moving on to the second video, Kevin, and we were privileged enough to have Andy Payton tweeting us and answering questions and getting involved because Andy was the cover star of the Celtic Collection video magazine. So like what you were saying before, if the club wanted to put out some footage these days, then you've got a full-time guy under normal circumstances up at Lennox Town recording. They put it all together and they put it out on social media or on Celtic TV. Back in these days, they had to put together a videotape. Now these things, even just looking at them, the chunky boxes, the whole shebang, it's so old-fashioned now looking at it. But the Celtic collection was the brainchild of a certain Terry Cassidy. And basically they wanted to release three or four videos a year to keep you updated as a fan about the goings-on at Celtic Football Club. This was the fourth and final Celtic collection. And the front cover tells us, Kevin, that it includes... All the UEFA Cup action, behind the scenes on the trip to Germany, the build-up to a Celtic Rangers game at Parkhead, exclusive interviews with new boys Slater and Peyton, and festive messages from the players and Super Celtic Christmas gift guide, your chance to meet the boys. So there we go, right? And I can't start talking about this until I read you the message on the back of the tape from the club captain Paul McStay, who I'm sure played a big part in writing this message. There's hardly a break in the punishing schedule of two games each week. But when I do get some time off, I look forward to sitting down and watching the Celtic collection. It's an accurate account of what's been happening at the club and all the players are determined to give you, the fans, plenty to cheer about in this and future editions. Here's to a successful 1993 for anyone connected with Celtic. So there you go. It was released in 92. That was definitely ghostwritten for Paul McStay. Maybe Terry Cassidy wrote it himself. So let's go back to the Celtic collection number four on the Axon Video Club. That was an enjoyable night because we had a player, an ex-player who was involved. What's, what's your thoughts? What's your critique on this video? It's like a walking advert for Celtic who are just dipping their toe into the rampant commercialisation of football that we know now. <laughs> One of the things that sticks out about this video was they go into the... The shop, it was not even the superstore. They go into the shop and can't remember who the commercial manager was at that time, but he's shown us jeans and leather jackets with Celtic crests on them. And <laughs> the, there's there's um, adverts for Club Call. Paul Cooney's sitting at a desk. With a phone that never rings. <laughs> and it's not plugged in. I, I don't know what they were actually going for here. It's just like a walking. 1970s advert for any big company trying to punt something and even the footage is not that great like you've got interviews with Andy Payton and Stuart Slater you've then got some interviews with fans outside the ground asking them who the greatest yeah. ever sell is and some wag does actually say their greatest ever sell is Stuart Slater and now that that, <laughs> that video clip hasn't aged well whatsoever no. you've got a build up to a Rangers game that we lost going to Dortmund that, that was not too bad I wouldn't say it was uh, behind the scenes footage but you saw Aye. them coming out the tunnel and stuff like that and Brian O'Neill with slip back hair looking a bit like Cristiano uh, Ronaldo as uh, Paul Lamb actually says on Twitter when he was watching it. But the funniest, funniest bit of this video is the Christmas messages. The Christmas messages they're are... They're terrible, eh? Oh, <laughs> they're dreadful. They're absolutely dreadful. Gordon Marshall. Oh. Gordon Marshall. Gordon Marshall's looking like Nicolas Cage's Cage. stunt double. You know Def- what I mean? Aye. He's sitting there. The big buckle bell, everything's <sighs> tucked in. Ah, uh, big Holmesy sitting there. Paul, Mc, the Paul, Mc, Paul McStay's got a polo neck and a shell suit combo on. It's just terrible. Aye. It's just. Can you remember when that was in? I can't. I can't never remember the I can polo never, neck and that, shell that suit must have, combo. That must have been a football player's uh, thing. Uh, no, for normal gadgets like myself. Shell suits, yes, but no polo necks. Nah, no polo necks. I mean, obviously there's some good bits. Cologne at Celtic Park. Jerry Craney. Yeah. Seen Jerry Craney scoring goals. Very, very romantic uh, when you look back at it. Craig Levine scoring a cracking own goal against us at Tynecastle. No, it's a cracking own goal for us at Tynecastle. That's something that you always like to see Craig Levine being unhappy. But it's a terrible, terrible video. <laughs> Andy was good. Andy answered quite a lot of the questions that we put yeah. to him. And another thing about this video, another thing I've got written down about this video, they, they asked fans... The team. 
The team let us down. <laughs> the team let us down. They asked fans who their greatest ever sell was. As I've already said, somebody says Stuart Slater. They also asked Ali McCoist who his favourite ever sell was. For that, no. this video should never have been released. So I'm going to look forward to seeing what you give it as a as a mark out of 10. But I mean, going on to some of the comments you've made, you're absolutely spot on. I mean, the graphics were, were really proper 80s style graphics. The Paul Cooney footage looks like the type of free video that an insurance company would send you through the post to try and get you to sign up for insurance that was absolutely devoid of any kind of charisma whatsoever. And the game footage, it's all right because, I mean, often, for example, the, the first game of the season against Hearts at Tynecastle, it was one nothing. it was a Craig Levine OG. Uh, but what you see from that game is things like, oh, we're wearing the last ever home jersey without a sponsor because there's no way that Celtic will ever have, not have a sponsor again. We're watching Paul McStay even then, running the show, Kevin, he was outstanding that day. When you look at the footage, you look back. Charlie Nicholas, who we've already mentioned, who, you know, at that time, he was carrying a bit of weight. He wasn't at his best. But he was ripping hearts to pieces when yeah, you look at the skills. I, I, you're right with Nicholas. And the two videos uh, that, that, that we've spoke about so far, Nicholas showed some great touches in both of them. And Aye. and Andy Payton actually says that he loved playing with Charlie Nicholas. He, he says he was just Aye, a really, did. really intelligent football player. You've already mentioned Gordon Marshall. What one thing these three videos actually show is we've got a bit of lack of quality in the goalkeeping department over all three of the videos. Eh? So, yeah. But as you say, you've got Nicholas there and it's really, it's difficult for me to remember Nicholas at that time eh? but when you see the, some of the clips, some of the goals that he scored, you go, you still had a bit of ability there, pal. Definitely. He did. I think the season before this one, where we were wearing the same kit, but we had the People's Ford sponsor on it. Nicholas had a good season. I think he, you know, scored he scored 25 goals that 25 season. goals, eh? Aye, uh, they, were, they were talking about him getting back into the Scotland squad and all that kind of stuff. He was showing a bit of form, but then this particular season was probably his final hurrah. I know that he'd stuck around for a few years after it, but he, he was never fit, really. But it's, it is interesting looking at some of the talent we had. Players like Dovjek, we've mentioned Dovjek before as a left-back, mm -hmm. quality, quality player. We still had Nick Stay turning on the style. We had John Collins. Craney was the youngster coming through and actually scoring goals and, and important goals in, in that. But another thing is you sign, you then sign Stuart Slater and you add that into the mix and he's a 1.5 million signing. He's an England B internationalist. And you look at two performances in particular, one against Rangers, Kevin, and then one away from home against Borussia Dortmund, Dortmund mm -hmm. where he looked outstanding. I mean, he was brilliant against Dortmund. Definitely. It's... He did have ability uh, for one reason or another. It just didn't work in a Celtic jersey. I, I've said before, I'm, I, I'm not going to be too hard on players who weren't a success at Celtic at that time because we were an absolute basket case and it's hard enough for footballers to come from different cultures, different leagues to settle in Glasgow anyway without the absolute chaos they were coming into in our football club at that time. So Slater obviously had ability, definitely, and he showed it in flashes. There's something quite therapeutic about watching these videos, knowing that we're sitting here the day, nine in a row champions. So that's some, there's something therapeutic looking back on, especially during this this time. Even though it was a terrible video, it was still good to get some buzzes in eh, the memories of scoring a last minute winner against Falkirk to one five four when I was in the Falkirk end. I, I remember that day, and when I saw that goal, I went, "That was a great, that was a great day. I loved that day." And so you've still got the wee moments like that Cologne being my first ever European game at Celtic Park. So, aye, we need to look back sometimes to appreciate now. One thing that uh, one of our contributors picked up on was the guy that was doing the presentation in the Celtic shop, Kevin. His name is Andrew Cassidy. And you just wonder if he was maybe Terry Cassidy's laddie, you know. Mm. And he's talking about high-end woolen jerseys and jeans with the Celtic crest embroidered on the pocket and all oh, that kind of stuff. I wonder if anybody's actually got a leather jacket with, that, with the Celtic crest. And I wonder if anybody's oh, got a pair of it. pair of jeans. Somebody out there's got to have got to have a set somewhere. What about the Celtic binoculars that was on show as, as well? I mean, 
it, it really does show you it was night and day. It was night and day when you look at the difference in commercialism and just the branding of the club from there until now. And it brings us up to the point, Kevin, I get the impression that you weren't too impressed with this particular video. Give us a as a mark out of 10 for this, this tape, the Celtic Collection, Volume 4. I'm going to give it a 2 out of 10 just because it showed me that day at Brockville <laughs> and it reminded me of Jerry Craney doing good things for Celtic Football Club and Andy Payton as well so I'll get a 2 out of 10 just uh, I think it's too I think I I think it's too for they actually made the effort to mould a pile of shite into something half decent in the field so but I give I I give them a mark for effort what I'm going to say is I just think it is still a document it does give us some new footage behind the scenes stuff the Christmas messages weren't meant to be dreadful but they were which makes it even funnier because they were trying to be professional and there are some new interviews in there that I wouldn't wouldn't have seen since I watched the video back in the in the 90s with the likes of Slater and and also Andy Payton so I'm going to be a wee bit more generous and I'm going to give it a base 6 out of 10, right? And Tommy Burns has been given an 8. This, I'm going to give a 6 to. When we look at some of the other collection, uh, Celtic collection videos, it'll be interesting if you think they were all rubbish or if there was one or two exceptions. So it was a concept that was brought up by Terry Cassidy and the concept re-emerged a few years later when Celtic released a video magazine called The Celtic Diary. Now, The Celtic Diary was released in 1997. The front cover has got George Cadet, Pierre Van Hoydonk, Paolo De Canio and Andreas Tom. We're looking at a period which was Tommy Burns' final season in charge at Celtic and the back of the box synopsis reads, Welcome to the first ever Celtic Diary. Well, that's a lie. With exclusive interviews and footage never before seen on video. The diary covers the opening of the new East Stand by Billy Conley and footage from the friendly with Sporting Lisbon. Also included in this diary debut is a review of the first half of season 96-97 in the Bells Premier Division. Exclusive interviews with Alan Stubbs and Paolo Di Canio on playing for Celtic and Tommy Burns' view on Scottish football in Europe. And by the way, they spelt Paolo Di Canio's name wrong in the back of this tape. <laughs> youth team coach Willie McStay talks about the youth development policy at Celtic and we interview Stuart Kerr and Barry Elliott on their experiences with the first team. All Celtic fans will love this new magazine format. So straight away, they're saying it's a new format. It's not. It's kind of made up the same way as the Celtic collection that you have just completely derided. Right, so we've gone back to that that concept. What's your memories of this? Was it any better? It is better because I think it's better produced, but also it is it is better because you've got Tommy, who you've got Tommy and Billy Stark, who are very personable, um, very articulate, and you get remembered about how good George Cadet actually was. He was fantastic, and I'm glad he's on the front cover um, because. I tweeted when I, after I watched this video, this video was George Cadet. This video was a, just a, a tribute to George Cadet in my eyes anyway. The goals that they show you that he scored. Everybody remembers De Canio's league debut at Kelly and when he does the, the, the wee jink in the box and toe pokes it into the back of the net. Mm-hmm. But Cadet ran riot that day and the highlights on this video prove that Cadet ran riot that day. He could score yeah. with his head and who doesn't love that wee finger twirling celebration and his hair shaking about oh it's fantastic. It's really really it was. <laughs> it's, it's really quite heartening and as you say it's a strange time so obviously this video must have been released for the Christmas market and let's bring yeah. you up to date and the season bloody collapsed <laughs> so if you hadn't watched it by the 1st of January then it was out of date by the time you got to the end of January because everything was tits up by that point so I had a very I had a, I had a very narrow shelf life these diary collection type things you did I think you had to you had to release some kind of quarterly Kevin for them to be effective didn't you De- definitely uh, it's really quite weird that these were probably still sitting in the Celtic shop and you, they would be asking you to pay a fiver for it when it's six months out of date it's a concept which other clubs obviously were doing it so it it wouldn't just been unique to Celtic that these quarterly diaries were coming out, but it was again it was George Cadet. It showed you like the opening, the opening of the East Stand by Billy Conley. It showed you Cadet scoring. As you say, you've seen the highlights. It's very unusual to see that Sporting Lisbon game right enough, unless you actually go looking for it. So that that was always a pleasure to 
to watch get be reminded that the problems that Tommy was going to have that season were very relevant in that game against Sporting Lisbon where we went 2-0 two no- two nothing up and ended up drawn to each. So our weak mm-hmm. defence was highlighted in pre-season there. Eh? The other thing this video actually highlights as well is something that the kit, kit guys on the Axon team picked up was that the, the original Bumblebee the reissues haven't they done it any justice whatsoever. When you see that original Bumblebee in this footage, it's a, it's a cracking one off top. Oh, it definitely is. See, when you're talking there about the, the signs for the bad defence being quite obvious and the, the pre-season friendly, you're absolutely right. But when you think about the, the squad, we offloaded John Hughes, who was always a, a stopgap, a journeyman defender who'd done a job for a, a short period of time. And we brought in Alan Stubbs. Now, that's an upgrade, Kevin, in terms of a defender. Definitely. Huge to Stubbs is an upgrade. And I think it comes back again to the fact that the real problem lay between the sticks. We're still giving a game to Big Holmesy, Big Gordon Marshall, right? And at some point during this particular video, we get an insight into what probably was Tommy Burns' kind of longer-term view in that respect, and that was Stuart Kerr. Now, we know things didn't work out in the long term for Stuart Kerr, but see some of his performances in this video. In, in some of his early games at Celtic, and there is an interview with him as well. He looked a real, a really promising prospect, Kevin. I mean, absolutely no bones about it. When you watch these early games that he played in, Stuart Kerr was outstanding in, in a number of these games. There's two really excellent interviews with, first of all, Alan Stubbs, and I used to love these uh, interviews at the time within Celtic Park because you were always sitting in front of some kind of wood panelled wall and you know there's a pennant or there's a picture or there's a trophy Mm -hmm. and over time because I've been involved with a lot of the collectors when I've been putting together my latest book these guys are going to be wondering where all this stuff is because you never see it when you're at Celtic Park now you know I know and uh, the interview with the Canio was, you know, you're looking at a guy who's wearing a denim shirt open collar a mint green v-neck sweater and he's just He's just the canio. And, and obviously since then, he's not looked upon as affectionately as he was when he was scoring goals and sticking his tongue out against Kilmarnock. The other point I noticed was Van Hooydonk. Van Hooydonk looked completely disinterested in a lot of the footage that was shown on this video. You looked at the dynamic runs of the canio, who was showing a lot of passion, all that kind of stuff. You looked at the class of the uh, cadet, like you say, scoring a lot of goals. But then all the footage that's shown you of Van Hooydonk, he looked disinterested by this stage, didn't he? And he got the move eventually that he wanted. So the video format, the magazine format, Celtic have tried it a few times. They'll never try it again, obviously, because we've moved on technologically. I think it was a massive success at Manchester United, because at that time, Kevin, the merchandise machine was mm-hmm. colossal, doing it at Old Trafford, didn't it? Still is, but that was the beginnings, I guess, of the the Premiership uh, Goliath. You know, just basically steamrolling in its way through football, and Celtic got a wee taste of that. But this was, to my knowledge, the only Celtic diary that were released, and obviously the season did fall off the edge of a cliff. So let's give it, let's give it a, a kind of rating because I think it's the same setup. Although we don't have a Paul Cooney figure um, sitting in his uh, grey office with a grey suit and a grey tie <laughs> and a grey phone, very grey. Uh, but we do have a, a similar kind of setup, a similar idea. I get what you say. If you're going to listen to a Tommy Burns interview over a Liam Brady interview, you're going to you're going to enjoy the Tommy Burns one more. So give it a mark out of ten. You gave the last one a two. I'm going to give this one a six out of ten, but. That is mainly just down to George Cadet and the home kit and the away kit and some of the memories that it stirred up for me as well. And I don't think it is as badly put together as the Celtic Collection one. Then, then again, maybe with the Celtic Collection one, I'm just put off with the Christmas messages. Maybe that's my... Uh, that's what I love about it. <laughs> You're looking at a videotape here, Kevin, that 25 minutes in and we're still at the, the Sport and Lisbon game. You know, and you think to yourself, there's so much more we could have done here. Us. You could have shown us much more behind the scenes it, stuff it, rather than extended highlights of a friendly game. There was an interesting wee bit with Willie McStay where he's interviewed. He's talking about the youth policy. There's some footage at Barrafield and you can spot some of the, the youth players of that era as well. Uh, Mark Anthony, mm-hmm. the, the prolific goal scorer. Uh, I spotted John Potter as well doing his runs. And there's interviews with guys like... Vcost who doesn't quite pull off the the green sweater like the Canio does, but it's always good to hear Vcost's bizarre accent, isn't it? It is good, and uh, Morton was a was a decent player for us. One of the things that Tommy says in this interview on on this video is that. He had a young squad and he named quite a few players and they were all 22, 23, 
or 24, eh? And when you think back about, obviously Paul was injured for a lot of that season and he eventually retired at the end of that season as well, eh? And the characters that we had who were causing problems, you've mentioned eh, Pierre Van Hoydonk, who looked like he wanted to be anywhere else. When you see him in this video, you've got the Canyo who we've already spoke about him. Players will tell you, John Hughes tell, tell you that he played for himself. I don't think we had a strong enough backbone. Eh? I think we were too young and didn't have a strong enough backbone. And that's how the season ended up falling off a cliff. But the music's slightly better in this one. Uh, I think we actually, uh, <laughs> I think we actually says that the song that the end with was probably Bentley River Mace, was it not? And it sounds like Bentley River Mace. It sounds like a B side. It certainly is. It's definitely an improvement on the music. It was a shame actually because there's a section of the there's a section of the video talking about McStay and the injury and, and Burns talking about getting him back in and it shows you him training at Barfield. Always love the old Barfield footage, Kevin, because you've got superstars from all over the world running about a, a totty field in Glasgow and um, McStay's been awarded an MBE and all this kind of stuff and to be honest with you, that, that completely went over my head. That passed me by. The fact that Paul McStay had been awarded that award and um, he's talking about that and he's there with all his family. He's not wearing a polo neck and a shell suit. He's wearing a a green sweater mm-hmm. with a white polo shirt underneath. So his dress sense probably improved as well over the piece. But I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give it a six, Kevin. Same as the collection, the Celtic collection, I'm gonna give this one a six. I do you think even though it's the same concept as the collection, I think it's done far, far better than the collection. So I'm gonna give it a six as well. Before we move on to where we're going next with the Axon Video Club, just one other mention for Gordon Marshall. His performance against Hibernian was one of the worst goalkeeping performances I've ever witnessed. He was clotheslining people. He was passing the ball to Darren Jackson and I think he sold two of the three goals. Big Marsh, he was definitely one of the the thorns in Tommy Burns' side without a shadow of a doubt. The next Axon Video Club is going to feature Lion Hearts, which is the 25th anniversary of the Lisbon victory and it's what you would say is appropriate in this weekend as we move towards the 25th of May. If you want to get involved, just use the hashtag Axon Video Club Join in the chat and we will be going live on Sunday night at 8 o'clock, Kevin. So I look forward to the chat then. Brilliant, Paul. Thanks very much. Hail, hail. 